So it's a real pleasure to talk to this. I believe you are still by quite a good deal, the youngest chapter of the Friends of Mineralogy, uh, born during COVID, but you seem to be going strong. So I'm going to be talking about the mineralogy of Mexican carbonate replacement deposits. And so that means I will actually tell you what they are, where they are, and um, some bits about Mexico. Uh, as always, I dedicate my talks on Mexico to memory of Miguel Romero, who was a good friend and an amazing collector of Mexican minerals. And sadly, I also have to dedicate it to the memory of Adriana Pagano, who passed away right before Christmas this year. Um, she was a lovely lady and a uh, very knowledgeable mineralogist and collector uh, and miss her greatly. And thanks to a whole bunch of people, chiefly Jeff Scoville, from whom many pictures have been, were, were taken, uh, Jim McGlasson, Gerardo Perez, Jesus Salinas, uh, guys I work with in Mexico on CRDs and on minerals, Mindat, the Tucson Gem and Mineral Society, and Allison and Lauren for being patient and uh, passionate about minerals, respectively. And a shout out to Alex Vensky, who celebrated his birthday last night. And if people weren't aware of that, happy birthday, Alex. Thank you, Peter. So um, I, most of the talks I do, or a lot of the talks I do, are to investment groups on, uh, for, for the benefit of publicly listed companies. And so we always have a safe harbor statement. And I'm going to give you one of those tonight saying, I'm a geologist. I don't pull any punches as far as that goes. So you're gonna get a fair dose of geology to go along with your minerals because I think it's important that people appreciate the geologic context of um, the specimens that they have. Now, I haven't quite been collecting this long, but I have been working in Mexico for about 40 years since I actually had hair and a body that was substantially svelter than what you see uh, today. Um, and the minerals have been following me home basically since the beginning. It's a nice little lot of mimetite that followed me home about 20 years ago from Ojuela. Um, so I learned a long time ago that I could bring these things home, keep the best two or three, find somebody to take the rest off my hands and with luck make my habit more or less self-financing. Working in Mexico has its challenges. Uh, this is now legal in many places here and in many places in Mexico, but in the past it has been dicey when you encounter this stuff, and it's always dicey when you encounter this stuff. So this is where you turn around and run. Um, like many other places in the Western US and uh, Western North America, rattlesnakes are common, both the two and four-legged kind and no-legged kind, but kids are everywhere. People are, you know, you're never alone when you're in the field, you'll be out there banging rocks and some kid will show up on a horse uh, to ask you what you're doing and uh, every once in a while, you, you wind up with a, a, a field assistant for a couple of days. Uh, kids are always friendly, always curious, uh, and they like rocks just like everywhere else. So looking at the geology of Mexico uh, very quickly here, um, working backwards from the way most geologists work, uh, start with the youngest rocks, the youngest real rocks, and that's the Trans-Mexico Volcanic Belt. People were talking about volcanic eruptions earlier. So this is the belt that includes Popocatepetl and Orizaba and Tequila and Colima, the big modern strata volcanoes uh, that go off periodically along a big fault zone that cuts through the central part or southern part of Mexico here. The next oldest rocks that we care about for the purpose of this talk are shown in Terracotta here. This is the volcanic and Plutonic rocks associated with the Sierra Madre Occidental Magmatic Belt uh, and its rocks related to this belt that are the volcanics that sit on top of many of the CRDs and the intrusions associated with this that are the source of the carbonate replacement deposits. They are hosted typically in what is shown here in green, which are Mesozoic sedimentary rocks dominated by limestones. Uh, sandstones and shales that were folded into what's called the Mexican fold thrust belt during the Laramide orogeny, the last time Europe got close enough to the to North America to collide with it and fold things into, into this belt. So this is the general geology that we'll be looking at today. 
So I started off a long time ago working in the Sierra Madre volcanics. Uh, this is treasure of the Sierra Madre kind of country. And what you're looking at here is about 1500 meters of stacked welded rhyolite ash flow tufts. This was a tough neighborhood about 35 million years ago when one of these big caldera type super volcanoes after another uh, was erupting. I started work on my master's thesis just outside Chihuahua City on this resurgent caldera that you can see here, the Sierra Pastorias caldera. And you, know, you don't even have to be, I actually picked this out before I really knew what I was doing. Saw this beautiful concentric set of mountains and said to my supervising professors, that's what I want to study. Uh, and it turned out to be a textbook resurgent caldera. Fortunately, right across the highway from this is a little place called the Santa Eulalia, which is a famous mining district. It's actually the reason why the city of Chihuahua is where it is. Chihuahua was the closest surface water to the mines of Santa Eulalia back during the Spanish era when the mines were in the oxide zone and they had no water. So they'd mine things at Santa Eulalia, haul them over to Chihuahua and beneficiate them. And so while I was working out here, some friends took me out to Santa Eulalia, introduced me to guys like Chino and Mateo Irigoyen, who have been running rock shops and selling minerals out of their kitchens, basements, and everything else for the last 50 years at least. Uh, and I have bought a lot of rocks from these guys over the years. My very first trip out there, I encountered some spectacular rhodochrosite specimens. Uh, which I was amazingly able to buy with the $12 that I had in my pocket. Uh, I was invited to come out to the Tucson show by Ed Huskinson, uh, who said, bring some of that stuff along with you. I recognized fairly quickly that I could keep the best, sell the rest, and pay for my thesis. Uh, and Ed was the one who taught me what makes a good specimen and why you should specialize and said, as long as you have special access to Santa Eulalia, maybe you should focus on Santa Eulalia, which is something that clearly I did for many years. Working in Santa Eulalia, um, it's a, been an active mine since the early 1700s. Um, and it is the biggest example of carbonate replacement deposit in Mexico. Now, I'm going to be fairly specific about what I mean by carbonate replacement. And when I say carbonate replacement deposit, I mean high temperature carbonate replacement deposits. There's other members of this family at lower temperature, like Mississippi Valley type deposits, which produce lots of specimens, are hosted in carbonate rocks, but they're low temperature deposits. Irish de type deposits are the same general breed of cat, slightly higher temperatures. Porphyry deposits, porphyry coppers, porphyry mollies will also make carbonate replacement style scarn mineralization if they're emplaced into carbonate rocks, but they have a different origin in terms of their magma. And epithermal veins, if they happen to cut through limestones, will make things that look like carbonate replacement deposits, but arguably aren't exactly. And we're not going to go down the academic rabbit hole of arguing what is and what isn't a CRD. But from a first order, what is a CRD? The mineralization is hosted, as the name suggests, in limestone or dolomite. These are high temperature deposits forming over 250, at over 250 degrees C. They're epigenetic, so they're not to be confused with volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits. They are sulfide rich. So when you look at them, if they're not oxidized, this is what they look like. This is a wall of massive galena and sphalerite. Um, they are related to intrusions, although they can, mineralization can develop over as many as seven or eight kilometers distant from the intrusion. They're polymetallic, which simply means they have a bunch of different metals in them. Silver, lead, zinc, copper, and gold are the dominant metals. Those are zoned with respect to the intrusion center, uh, but they're all present at different parts in the system. They are dominated by replacement as opposed to open space filling. We'll talk about replacement in a little bit of detail. That mineralization that I mentioned, zoning from the intrusion outward is continuous. These are polyphase evolving systems, at least the big ones are. That means we'll see that 
Uh, there's a lot of superimposition of one fluid packet after another that gives you complex overprinting. It gives you lots of pseudomorphs, gives you very large scale zoning. And a final comment is most of these appear to be Phanerozoic, but there's a couple of things in the Precambrian that could be highly distorted or deformed CRDs. So for mineral specimen collectors, you are very familiar with CRDs, even if you're not exactly sure what they are. Bisbee, Magma, Tiger, Leadville Gilman, Tintic, Magdalena, the Kelly Mine. The Glove, the Defiance, Tombstone, the Taylor deposit found here and recently in Arizona. These are all U.S. examples of these deposits, big ones. In Mexico, a lot of the names you'll hear tonight include Sariolalia, Ojuela, Nica, Concepcion del Oro, Los Lamentos, San Pedro Coralitos, Charcas, Wadley, San Martin, San Carlos, Cobrisa, Moriento, Etcientos, and, and Unsovaita, as they say in German. Uh, in South America, examples would include Uchuchacua, Wansala, Ica, Pachapaque, Santa Rita, and Hokani. And in Europe, um, Lavrion, Dalnagorsk, Medan, Trepsha, Serafos, Mibladen, Yaogongshang, and Wangang in, in China. And part of the point of mentioning all of these is because these deposits form through a very similar process, acting in slightly different environments, you wind up with remarkable similarity in terms of their mineralogy and down to the form that many of the specimens and the crystals take. So you see a fluorite from a from Nika, for example, and you see one from Yaogongshang, and they're remarkably similar. And you get these deposits that like Dalnagorsk, it looks like it's a mixture of Sadiolalia and Charcas and Nika and so on and so forth. But once you recognize the similarity, you have a geologic link, the thread that goes through all these deposits that lets you understand a little more about how they form. So I mentioned Lavrion. Lavrion, it means place of silver. It's about 50 kilometers south of Athens uh, from 483 BC until 322 BC. They mined about 160 million ounces of silver. And that silver paid for the fleet that de defeated the Persians in 480 BC. And this allowed the blossoming of Athenian democracy. So this is a pretty important deposit because simple logic tells us that if silver from Lavrian CRDs underpinned Athenian society and Athenian culture is the foundation of Western civilization, then ergo CRDs are the foundation of Western civilization. So they're the most important ore deposits uh, to anybody who lives in the Western world from a cultural standpoint. Why do we look for these things? I'm in economic geology, exploration is what I do. You wanna know what it is you're looking for and why. They're big, 10 to 150 million tons, very high grades of silver, zinc, lead, and copper. Uh, credits with a bunch of elements like gold, gallium, germanium, indium, tungsten, cadmium, moly. All of these are important economically, but they're even more important when we start talking about the mineralogy, especially the secondary oxidation mineralogy. They tend to have low mining costs, they're metallurgically docile, and this is increasingly important in the world today. They have a minimal environmental footprint. So you're not talking about big open pit mines, you're talking about much more selective high-grade underground mining. So the three main ingredients you need for one of these deposits is a carbonate host that acts as an alkaline buffer. The ore fluids, and the altering fluids after they've dumped their goodies are acid, saline, and high temperature. And then you need a plumbing network. So a series of cracks or whatever works its way through the carbonate rocks. And that ultimately is what influences the shape and the zoning of one of these systems. So the replacement process, and this is really elegantly laid out in an article in Elements by Putnus and John from 2010. And if you don't have that, or if you don't subscribe to Elements, you certainly should, but it's a coupled dissolution and precipitation process. So you have this acid saline fluid that's charged up with metals, fluorine, silicons, sulfur, and all of this, and it's expelled from the intrusion, 
along a fracture system, it encounters that alkaline host rock and it dissolves on a molecular basis, a little bit of that calcium carbonate that neutralizes the fluid and causes the essentially instantaneous precipitation of the sulfides in gang. So it's a constant repeated process of eating a little carbonate and depositing the sulfides in those nano voids uh, over time. So because these are multi-stage repeating processes, some stages are stronger than others. So some of them will be better expressed than others. And this gives you superimposition of stages and products. So you get zoning, overgrowths, and pseudomorphs. And you can pick this out of the specimens. It's one of the reasons why if what you like in your specimens is multiple different species in a spe single specimen, uh, these are the deposits for you because they tend to have three, four, five, or as many as 10 different species on a single sort of hand size specimen. As always, the devil is in the details. And so the primary minerals that form reflect the chemistry of the system. And they also reflect, reflect their position relative to the source. But all of these extra metals, especially things like arsenic and vanadium and tungsten and tellurium affect the mineralogy and then later on affect the secondary mineral. The other cool aspect of these deposits is open space. Now, if you want to grow big mineral crystals, you need an open space to grow them in. And carbonate replacement deposits make open space just through their process at all of their stages of development. So in the replacements, the primary replacement stage, sulfides and scarn silicate minerals have an atomic structure that's more compact than the carbonate they're replacing, about a 20% volume reduction. And at a certain point, you get enough of those sulfides and silicates that have replaced limestone, they're just too weak to support their own weight and they collapse. And so you get these breaches in the sulfides, especially in your vertically shaped ore bodies that create open spaces into which the next pulse of fluid can deposit nice big crystals. So in a cartoon standpoint, here's a fracture running vertically through limestone, one pulse after another of, sol of fluids coming through, primarily working upward along that fracture, diffusing laterally, giving you this pipe-like or chimney-like body of sulfides. At a certain point, that collapses, creating lots of open space, and a lot of that open space accumulates at the top, and you get nice big pockets at the top for those crystals to grow in. Frequently, these things completely plug up and so what you get is something like this which was a chimney of scarn in the la negra deposit in mexico and so you these blocks of scarn with the sulfide filling in the voids in between obviously as collectors we would like to see this in a place where that process was arrested before it filled the voids completely uh, this just happens to be a good picture of one of them the other side of the equation is we got to pay attention to the mass balance the carbonate that's dissolved is not destroyed. It's picked up by the spent fluids, which have dumped out most of the metals that we care about, but there's still some residual elements that haven't deposited. And these, migrate, these fluids migrate outward along the same plumbing network and then deposit secondary, what I call fugitive carbonate that plugs up the peripheral porosity and permeability. I call it fugitive because it used to be where the sulfides are now and it has now escaped to some position further out in the system. So in a cartoon standpoint, here's the basic comp components of this. We have our intrusion. It's expelling fluids into a sedimentary package, which is sandstones and shales and limestone shown here in blue. The limestones get replaced either horizontally making what we call a manto, or if this was oriented vertically, we would call it a chimney. And then the fluids redeposit the secondary carbonate along the plumbing network in front of the replacement body, but also in fractures working their way outward from it. And the fun thing about this is that manganese is one of the minerals that is metals that's routinely incorporated into this secondary fugitive carbonate. And so what that means is out in front of these ore bodies, and this is looking at some core, you can see the fractures filled with this carbonate, which fluoresces a beautiful orange to pink orange color. 
And we're actually, we've got a guy who's been working on this for a couple of years and is demonstrating that the orange really is the manganese and a little bit of lead activates that fluorescence and kicks it in the pink direction. So we actually can routinely log core with a fluorescent light, ultraviolet light, and we can vector towards mineralization based by the, on the color that we see in the secondary carbonates. Now, this is also important for specimen collectors because what it means is a lot of the calcite you see associated with your specimens from these is manganoan and it will fluoresce a beautiful color. So if you have a UV light and CRD specimens with calcite on them, you can go in and lamp your collection and a lot of them will do this. And it's one way to distinguish the primary or related calcites from the secondary calcites that form during the oxidation stage when there's iron oxide floating around, which tends to attenuate uh, the fluorescent response. So when we look at this as a model, uh, we see an intrusive body. This can be a productive porphyry or a barren porphyry surrounded by calc silicate scarn, which then gets overprinted by sulfides. And as you work your way out of the, sulf the scarn zone, you wind up with these carbonate replacement bodies, mantos and chimneys that can extend several kilometers away. If you have unreactive rocks on top of those, sometimes they cut through as veins and you tend to get these big alteration halos over the top of them. So when I'm looking for one of these, I'm looking for evidence for this alteration halo telling me where the intrusion is that drove the system. And then I want to work my way back from there and try to link it up with the little prospects and things like that that may crop out on the surface. Just a few examples, places you've heard of. This is the NICA deposit. These are all chimneys in the case of NICA. And NICA, you could think of, uh, it's got 88 plus chimneys. So think of it as 11 octopus swimming downhill or downstream and their tentacles flailing behind them. And that's what NICA looks like. And one, just one of those tentacles reached high enough so that erosion has been able to get down to it. So the entire NICA deposit was found based on that. Ojuela, a very similar kind of geometry. Uh, Ojuela is deeply oxidized to about 600 meters. Uh, so here's the famous bridge. And these are the ore bodies that were found in outcrop and traced downward for 600 meters over about 350 years. And you can see this is from our article with Tom, my article with Tom Moore from back in 200, 2004 in Min Record, where we show where the individual atomite and Lagrandite and uh, purple atomite pockets are in this fabulous system. And of course, Sadiolalia, I have to show you a picture of that. This is a composite long section of Sadiolalia. So this is six parallel ore trends projected to a single plane these mantos that are over 4,000 meters long and as much as a kilometer high, all related to these felsic sills at depth. In plan, they look like a bowl of spaghetti or the fingers of a skeletal hand. So here's a huela. Uh, you're looking at a kilometer or more in terms of length here. Santa Eulalia, more than four kilometers here with this finger-like uh, expression. The best belt in the world for these deposits is the Cordillera of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so these things occur from Tierra del Fuego on up to Alaska, Mexico, and Arizona into the Great Basin are where the really big deposits are in North America. That's where I've spent most of my time exploring. When we look at where these deposits are in Mexico, so here we've gone back to that geologic map and I've dropped the carbonate replacements of Mexico as red dots or green dots. The reds are the big, the greens are the small, or at least the ones that are known to be small. You don't need to understand why these deposits are where they are in terms of exploration to say, I'm going to focus on this red line because that's where the big, big deposits are. But there is an underlying geologic reason why they're there. And it's because of Mexico's geologic history or tectonic history since the Jurassic of repeated coaxial compression and extension as North America and Europe have danced with each other and then moved away and then danced with each other again. So what, so 
most of the action as far as the ore deposits are concerned happened around 30 million years ago, 30 to 35 million years ago. And so to understand what was going on then, you have to put Baja back where it used to be uh, instead of on its way to Mendocino or San Francisco. Uh, it slips back here nicely down to Puerto Vallarta. There was a continuous subduction zone operating off the west coast of Mexico. And you get these really nice parallel bands of ore deposits of roughly similar style and age parallel to this, reflecting the fact that they are related to this subduction zone that was active for uh, just under 100 million years. Uh, and what we really care about is what goes on in the upper crust here where these magmas have risen from depth, many of them generated by partial melting of the lower crust. Those magmas rise, they differentiate, and if they erupt, you get volcanoes. If they don't, you get plutons. If they're emplaced in limestone, you get CRDs. And that's what we like in Mexico. And this belt represents the combination of being at the western edge of the fold thrust belt, where you have thick sections of the right carbonate host rocks that were smashed, stacked up, structurally prepared for mineralization. And those lie at the eastern edge of the magmatic belt where those intrusives were able to rise to high level in the crust and encounter thick sections of structurally prepared carbonate. So the ideal recipe for making a belt of large deposits. So just, to, I think that's most of the geology. We're gonna transition into a little bit of mining history here. Um, everyone has heard of the Sumeb of Mexico, the Ojuela mine. This is what it looked like at around the turn of the last century. Uh, company housing for the workers over here, company housing for the British, German, and American engineers over here. Uh, the famous bridge uh, ascribed to Roebling, but actually really built by one of his disciples and the steam plants and everything here that drove the shafts, drove the hoists that brought the mineralization up from three, four, 500 meters below the surface. Uh, it was a busy place. Um, it was a nice place for advertising both Hercules and uh, Atlas powders. And just another view of that workers, worker, worker colony. Uh, the streets were nicely cobblestoned and paved. These were nice straight streets, nice buildings. Uh, you could go into the bar and get yourself a Corona. That's the brand of beer being advertised right here. People look quite prosperous. And they were in this part of town. On the other side of town in the non-company housing, things were a little bit different. Uh, this was really stack up the rocks and make your own house. Uh, if you lived there and you had to happen to be you know, the wife of a miner, uh, your life was almost as hard scrabble as his, maybe more so, because you probably didn't get to leave work at any point. Um, and you got to do that looking across this little canyon uh, at the nice fancy housing of the company uh, salaried employees, the the we can be honest and say the white employees, the white Protestant employees with their little Protestant church on this side as opposed to the Catholic church on the other side. Uh, not much of it's left. This is all that's left of that hill that was covered with company housing. Uh, not any more left on the, on the rich people side. The bridge is still there. You can still go and, 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 and cross the bridge. Um, I got to fly around this place in a helicopter one afternoon, which was pretty much fun, but you can go down, you can walk across the bridge, and over here there's guys who will take you underground and walk you through some of the stopes in the upper part, and if you're really adventurous, you can go all the way through and come out on the other side of the mountain <clears throat> and walk back on the surface and look at some of the surface installations and the paths where people hauled the ore by mules before they built this bridge to gap, to bridge the, the canyon. Moving to Sadi Eulalia, uh, the original discovery was made walking up a canyon at the north end of the district. Uh, very primitive mining techniques. In those days, you really didn't want to be a miner back in the Spanish colonial era. Uh, you'd have been much happier being the owner of the mine. There's a spectacular article from uh, 1867, written by Governor Lou Wallace on the mines of Sadiulalia, 
<clears throat> this is basically the first thing he ever wrote of any note. But about 20 years later, he wrote a book called Ben-Hur, which became the uh, best-selling novel of the 19th century, uh, beating out uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. So in 1908, Santi Eulalia uh, was doing pretty well. Steam plants, just like we saw at Ojuela. This is the Buena Tierra shaft, the Potosi shaft. These are both shafts that are, are, are still accessible or usable today if they had any money or any ore to use them with. Uh, high grade ores, lots of pretty specimens. So the miners were very carefully searched when they came out of the mine every day. This is looking at Santa, the Sierra Santa Eulalia from the airport. Uh, so you see the limestones that host the mineralization here. These are the capping volcanics that are a little bit darker. The little town of Santa Eulalia is back up in there. This is looking at the West Camp installation. So this is those two shafts I was just showing you. The, the Buena Tierra and the, and the Potosi shaft is down in here. I spent three summers living in that room right there. Moving down the road to Nika. Uh, Nika is a much more recent mine. Nika really didn't have much history before the early, late 1800s. Uh, very similar primitive conditions. They finally built a train and that changed the economics of Nika. But that little tendril that I showed you reaching the, that, that gets to the surface was the only oxidized part of Nika. So it didn't have a big mining history uh, during the days of oxide mining. Uh, this is a little bit later, 1911. Uh, things had grown up a little bit, but it was this was the literally the end of the road. It still is the end of the road, and a pretty hard scrabble existence out there. So again, there's that single ore body that the surface has reached, and that's what it looks like right there. These are dumps from subsequent shafts, but that was the entire surface expression of NICA, and that's very typical of carbonate replacement systems. Just looking from the new mine offices up toward that same outcrop up there. And one of the fun things that, ha that happened at NICA is NICA has the reputation or this legend in Mexico as being the world's headquarters for witches. And so at night when the sun goes down, these witches emerge from the, from the old mine workings up on the side of the mountain as these balls of fire and they fly around and they look for stray children wandering the streets after they were supposed to be home and in bed and they hijack them and they either eat the boys and they, they eat the boys and they turn the girls in, into witches themselves. So there's actually videos from international competitions about Las Brujas de Naica. And with the discovery of the cave of the cave, the crystals, the witches have been combined and conflated with the gypsum. So you get these marvelous bumper stickers of these witches flying around inside the cave of, of the giants. It's kind of a weird cultural effect there. So why are Mexican CRDs or CRDs anywhere such great specimen producers? They contain lots of different elements. We got lots of ingredients for making a wide range of specimens. They self-generate open space at primary, at, at important times during primary mineralization. And then again, during secondary oxidation as a lot of material is flushed out, acid is generated and it expands the size of the voids. Mexico has been pretty stable tectonically since the deposition. So it's sat there, the oxidation has happened over about the last 25 million years, getting deep, but not being eroded away. So you wind up with deep oxidation, good generation of oxide species, and they're still preserved. That's why you have a system like Ojuela with 600 meters of oxide zone, or 350 at Santa Eulalia, or Los Lamentos, which is another 350. Uh, that gives us good secondary minerals. So in a very simple way of looking at things, here's that primary zone, dominantly a simple sulfide assemblage, dominated galena, sphalerite, pyrite, or pyrotite. And then with oxidation uh, coming down from the surface, you turn your galena into things like mimetite and your, your sphalerite into things like uh, atomite. And the whole world of collectors can be satisfied by things from here. These deposits, 
close to the intrusions are essentially scarns, so they're dominated by calc silicate minerals, mostly massive, but you do see sprays of pyroxene and nicely formed garnets, epidotes, some of the secondary or retrograde species. Some of these deposits, like the Cerro de Crucis and, and uh, Coahuila, give you the nice pink garnets because they contain enough manganese to make them pink or they contain so much iron that they're dead black. These are called melanites by some people. They don't have any titanium in them. They're just black andradites, but they're gorgeous. Uh, Vesuvianite, also from Cerro de Cruces, extremely well-developed, world-class specimens. And then you get places like Charcas, where the assumption or the interpretation is that there's actually borates, borates in the stratigraphic sequence. And so you wind up with this system that instead of having quartz or it does have volumes of calcite but instead of quartz or calcilic uh, garnets and pyroxenes you wind up with massive quantities of danburite uh, probably the world's most famous or at least most voluminous danburite locality and because the systems cycle and you have multiple stages of mineralization you wind up with combinations in this case amethyst on danburite or citrine on danburite. These came out a couple of years ago, really sweet thumbnails and small miniatures. Danburite's relative datalite, extremely well developed. You see datalites that look very much like this from Dalnagorsk as well. This is a large cabinet specimen that used to be in Del Romero's collection. And then you get the amethyst on the datalite, uh, giving you a very nice purple and green uh, combination. The common sulfide, obviously, most common, or in, in fact, almost any sulfide deposit can be characterized as an iron sulfide deposit contaminated by lead, zinc, copper, and some other things. Um, pyrite, very, very common in these deposits, as is pyrotite. Think Dalnagorsk, same kind of thing. Pyrotite, especially in the proximal reduced parts of the system, is the dominant iron sulfide. Galena, very commonly twinned, very commonly slightly resorbed, slightly out of equilibrium with the late fluid, so you wind up with these kind of melted looking surfaces, very common on CRD galenas. Uh, in this particular case, you see the same thing. Again, secondary amethyst growing on top of it from night. Sphalerite can be exceptionally well developed, typically very iron rich. Uh, it can range from uh, only a few percent to as much as about 30% FES dissolved in the sphalerite structure. Uh, once you're higher than about 9%, they're just black, so they're called marmotite. But these things contain all kinds of oddball elements, or at least elements that don't wind up anywhere else. And so when this stuff oxidizes, you can get some pretty interesting mineralogy. And again, combinations, quartz and calcite on top of these coarse folks. Of course, sphalerites, this one's from Nica. Previous one was from Saudi Olalia. Calcopyrite, less common typically in the distal parts, but increasingly common in the proximal parts. This one associated with galena, a little bit of calcite on top of it, also Nica. Some of this growth here indicates that these calcopyrites actually formed as epitaxial high temperature overgrowths on sphalerite. And so some of the polysynthetic twinning you see in the sphalerite is actually reflected in the later layers of, of calco on top of them. Uh, calcopyrite typically will get a nice oxidation coating on it. And again, you can see in this case, it's growing on quartz and is overgrown by fluorite. So, and then you've got some sphalerite here. So you've got a four off uh, just in the little hand specimen miniature here from the San Antonio mine. Arsenopyrite, very common, uh, very well-formed crystals, uh, very common in these. A place like Ojuela, the deep ores there are 18% arsenopyrite. So if you ever wondered where the arsenic came from to make all those arsenates, that's the answer. This one is from the San Antonio mine. That is a small cabinet specimen. And from Nica growing on sphalerite, uh, you see these radiating groups of more elongate habits of arsenopyrite. So some really attractive specimens from there. 
Silver minerals are less common than you'd think because most of the silver is stuffed in the galena in various kinds of inclusions and intergrowths. Uh, but you do occasionally get nice acanthites after, in this case, pseudomorphing argentite from Satiwalia. And rarely you get things like pyrargyrite. This is a very nice crystal group, large thumb, uh, toenail, I guess we'd call it, uh, from Tosco. And in the micro world, you can get lots and lots of different things. This is from Sandiolalia. This is a little proustite from the main silicate ore body, which is a body that's very similar to the overall mine at Uchuchaqua in Peru. Argento pyrite. Again, this is a micro. This is about, I don't know, maybe four, four millimeters long with little polybasites clustered around the base. Uh, but every once in a while, you get some spectacular silvers. This is from the San Martin mine in Zacatecas. This is a cabinet specimen, uh, beautiful coarse wires mined sometime in the 1960s. Tetrahedrite, quite common, especially in places like Concepcion del Oro, where you've seen those specimens of tetrahedrite and tenantite on quartz that came out from the Cobre mine by the by the boatload. The little red here is actually a reflection of my shirt when I took the picture, so don't think there's anything red in that picture. This is an example of that classic bote material or cobre material, uh, and these are actually repeated layers of tetrahedrite and tenantite. John White did a nice article on these when they first came out in Min Record back in the early 70s. Bornanite is uncommon, but, but does occur. Uh, this is a thumbnail wheel from, from Nika uh, with calcite and a little bit of chalcopyrite. Uh, very sharp, very lustrous, quite rare, but uh, when they come out, you tend to see a fair number of them. Cinnabar is not an uncommon distal component in these systems. This one is from Charcas. This is sort of classic material from there. This is a, a miniature. Uh, those crystals are half a centimeter across. Stibnite, very common from certain deposits down in San Luis Potosi. This is a very nice spray that just came out of a relatively unknown mine called La Cobrisa uh, that I acquired about a year ago. Uh, you see a bazillion, uh, let's call it stibiconite sample uh, replacements after stibnite from a number of these deposits, principally the Wadley mine. It was one of the world's biggest sources of antimony for a number of years. And as I mentioned, pseudomorphs, very common. This started off as pyrotite, sort of a fat tabular and an elongate hexagonal prism. The prism is replaced by galena. The prism part is the, the fat tabular part is replaced by pyrite and then it's all sprinkled over with rhodochrosite. This was from the Ed Swoboda um, pseudomorph collection. That's a cabinet specimen, uh, Santa, West Camp of Santa Eulalia. And pyrite pseudomorphs after pyrotite are very common in these systems. This is a large cabinet specimen from Santa Eulalia. You can find similar material from Nica, Concepcion del Oro, etc. It turns out that the kinetics of the reaction to sulfidize pyrotite to pyrite are very slow. So only a deposit that sits and stews in its own juice for a long time can develop this texture, which means when we see this, whether it's in drill core or hand specimens, or even in oxide fragments on a dump, it's telling us that we're in a system that's worth a little more time exploring. So we use this as a first order exploration guide. And sometimes, like at NICA, they'll pick up a really nice oxidation uh, iridescence, uh, making for very attractive hand specimens. That's a miniature. Because the wall rock is calcite, it's getting dissolved and reprecipi reprecipitated. Calcite dumps out in myriad different habits, sizes, combinations, forms. Uh, you can it's impossible to collect CRDs without becoming a calcite collector, even if that isn't your first love. The habits are wonderful. Uh, these beautiful scalenohedra are very common. Uh, in the primary zone, you tend to have more rhombohedral and platy material in the secondary. These are both from Sadiulali. This is from the East Camp. This is from the West Camp. This dog tooth calcite style has come out by the ton from there. 
We talked about the calcite picking up some manganese. Sometimes it picks up enough manganese that it gets pink. Uh, these are classics from the Aransasu mine. Uh, the, 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 uh, I'll come up with the right name in a minute. Uh, one of the mines in Concepcion del Oro, this is actually growing on a quartz crystal that's covered with yellow calcite and then the late stage of uh, mangano and calcite growing on top of that. Sometimes you see these labels as spherocobaltite, they don't have any cobalt in them. Dolomite, also common in a lot of these systems, more common in CRDs in Western US than in Mexico. Uh, the dolomite can get pretty fancy with these Baroque uh, ROMs. Very common to see it as a pearly crystalline coating on earlier stages of carbonate. This one's from NICA. So this is a calcite ROM coated by pearly dolomite with quartz coming in and pyrite coming off of it. So again, lots going on in a single sample. Talked about rhodochrosite and manganese in these deposits. Uh, you can get some extremely nice rhodochrosites in some of these. This one is from Tosco. This is a uh, cabinet specimen. Here, this, this is rhodochrosite actually overgrowing uh, coarse rhombohedral calcite, also from, uh, from Tosco uh, with quartz and sphalerite. Sometimes they occur with nice little sprays of ilvaite. The real place to get them, though, is Santa Eulalia, where you get these beautiful gemmy rhodochrosites in these bugs within this strange iron calcic scarn uh, from a single ore body in the west camp of Santa Eulalia. And they have a wonderful different array of shapes. This is a thumbnail specimen, the fairy ring of rhodochrosite. Uh, this was in Miguel Romero's collection. That's about five centimeters across, elongate jemmy scalenohedrons topped by rhombohedra. Here's a piece I picked up a couple of years ago, uh, rhodochrosite with these nice green octahedral fluorites. Same ore body, multiple, every pocket is different. And those pockets are filled with microcrystal and microcrystals of fun things. Quartz is very common in these systems, very seldom as simple quartz crystals, very common to see multi-stage things like these scepters, uh, sort of parasitic growths coming off the face of these crystals. This thing is about 15 centimeters tall. Uh, with these beautiful crystals coming off almost perpendicular to the prism faces. In some cases, they are definitely perpendicular to the prism faces. Big war club uh, scepter from Charcas. That's about uh, 15 centimeters tall. Again, those multi-stage spiky cactus quartzes also Japan Law Twins are pretty common in these deposits. It, it appears that Japan Law Twins like the environment of SCARN and replacement systems, so they tend to be associated with them worldwide. And you know, even places that you think of as sources of, uh, this, is, this is from uh, Matitlan in Guerrero, this is from uh, Las Vegas. Those are both SCARN replacement systems and you know, occasionally, very rarely, you'll get Japan Law Twins at Las Vegas. Never seen one from there. Uh, John White thinks this may be the highest density of Japan Law Twins on the planet. Uh, this is a miniature uh, from the San Antonio mine at Santa Eulalia. Every one of those groups that, that you see on there is a Japan Law Quartz Twin. As you see from a lot of these other deposits, the quartzes tend to include things like the amphiboles after clinopyrexenes, and you get the sort of price or praseolite green quartzes that are very common from here, common from Seraphos, common from uh, Nika, Dalmagoras, whatever, worldwide, very common. This one's from Nika with calcite and sphalerite. Multi stage growth, very common. This is a phantom, small miniature from Santa Eulalia. Uh, excuse me, miniature from Santa Eulalia, early stage of quartz covered with botryoidal manganese oxides and rhodochrosite, and then this late limpid stage of, uh, of clear quartz. Uh, Leah Luton painted a spectacular picture of this specimen for me. Fluorite is a ubiquitous gang mineral in these systems. Uh, purple is very common. Colorless is more common. This one's from the San Antonio mine. This is about 12 centimeters across, 
The coating on here is smithsonite. So this comes from the zinc accumulation zone. Uh, this is an example from San Martin and Zacatecas. These sort of crystals that are built up into forms, in this case, cubes built up by other cubes or cubes built up by octahedra or vice versa are very common in these systems. Uh, here's a fairly iconic specimen of mine from Nica, this, this octahedron. It's about uh, eight centimeters from point to point. Um, and you can see it's a composite crystal, uh, clearly growing almost skeletal uh, kind of fashion. Very common from Nica. Uh, Pen, uh, contact twins of, uh, or interpenetration twins, sorry, of uh, uh, fluorite and fluorite, giving you these hexagonal tabular uh, crystals, sometimes referred to as spinel twins. Uh, there's been a reasonably good debunking of that recently in Min Record, I think, or could have been rocks and minerals. This is my daughter, Lauren's specimen. That's a miniature. And then you get places like Ojuela, which in producing a bunch of other things, there's actually fluorite that survived the oxidation event, so it wasn't affected by all of that. You get these beautiful, lustrous purple crystals, and one of the cool things about fluorite, not all of it, but a lot of the fluorite from Ojuela, is that it is blood red fluorescent under long wave. So if you see one of these, and if you like fluorite, and if you like fluorescence, you got to check them out, because you can get some really flashy color out of some of these. As with everything else, multi-stage is very common, common to get a calcite on top of your fluorite. And you get multi-stage fluorites. This was an octahedral fluorite covered with little galenas, then covered by cubic and trisoctahedral uh, fluorite stages. Uh, again, lots going on, long-lived pulsing system. You can get a good story out of these. Uh, at Santa Eulalia, you get enough fluorine floating around that it actually replaces the earlier formed scalenohedral calcite. So these are both uh, miniatures, partially and completely replaced uh, by fluorite. These are solid fluorite to the core. So these are not simply epimorphs. Barite is pretty common. Normally it's massive and boring, but occasionally in places like Nica, you get some nice crystals like this uh, small cabinet here, or this miniature of barite with these peculiar elongate oriented pyrite growths uh, at the corners of the barite. And I've always found this to be quite an unusual specimen. Celestine is common in, in some of these deposits, especially ones that have some basin brines entrained within them. This is a nicely twin celestine. Uh, that's about five centimeters long. Uh, this is from the west camp of Santa Eulalia. And hydrite doesn't tend to survive very well, except in a place like Nica. This is sort of a bow tie, about 15 centimeters across from there. Here's another example of beautifully twinned plate. This is more like 20 centimeters from point to point with calcite on it. Many of these come out with calcite and the miners burn it off with sulfur hydrochloric acid. Mentioning Nica, mentioning anhydrite, Next thing you see at Nica, of course, is lots of gypsum, these beautiful, sharp, limpid crystals, in this case, from the Chubasco ore body. And there's a host of weird things that occur in some of these deposits. San Eulalia, very famous, San Antonio mine famous for ludlamite. This is a miniature. Or vivianite, that specimen is about eight centimeters tall. That used to be in John Barlow's collection. Credite, very nicely developed in the west camp of Santa Eulalia and the, the Potosi mine. This is a miniature group, it used to be in Miguel Romero's collection. And you get a few zeolites floating around or zeolite relatives like these stilbites from uh, San Martin. That's about four centimeters across for the little yellow bow tie. And fluoropophyllite, pink fluoropophyllite especially is common as a late stage in a lot of these, in this particular case, this is a miniature from Nica with anhydrite coated by a younger fluoropophyllite. And in places like Charcas, you get some really weird stuff like nifontavite. Uh, this is a uh, small cabinet specimen uh, of nifontavite from there. So these deposits are fun when they're primary, but they get even more interesting 
when they get oxidized. So the oxidation that, that generates abundant open space for secondary mineral growth. So you get additional volume reduction because you're flushing stuff out. You're generating acid that gives you solution of the limestones around and below the ore bodies. Those oxides collapse into that. You get separation of soluble versus insoluble elements. And then those soluble things dump out again as supergene deposition uh, at greater depth. So you start off with massive sulfides, you wind up with massive Gaussians, and the minerals are going to reflect whatever the primary chemistry was, plus the meteoric water flux, the local climate, how long things had to oxidize, how rapid erosion was, and stuff like that. Fortunately, Mexico was stable for a long time, so oxidation really got advanced. So you start with the sulfide manto in limestone, and you oxidize it, and you generate a rubble breccia of lead carbonates, typically an open space lined with halectites. Uh, and the old timers used to go in and pry up the halectites to go after this cerusite because that's where the silver was. Big spaces, big holes make room for bigger specimens. Lots of calcite grows in these things, especially in those cavities that form on the top of the collapsing ore body. You get all kinds of weird habits like this cobra calcites from La Mojina in, in northern Chihuahua. This is a, a cabinet sized specimen. And the holectites, like I just mentioned, this just came out within the last six months from one of these old bodies that was found in Santa Eulalia. That thing's about 20 centimeters tall. You had your gypsum forming late. It gets coated by goethite from the oxidation process. The gypsum gets leached out and you wind up with these classic epimorphs of you know, goethite after gypsum, little calcite forming on top of it. The specimen is fairly well known as the shipwreck. And of course, oxidation is when we start to get really colorful in these deposits. So you Silver minerals give you the silver halides, in this case bromargerite from Santa Eulalia. These are only a couple of centimeters, a couple of millimeters across, but a very attractive color. Your cerusite obviously is not no, so, always so colorful itself, but the way it breaks up the light can be colorful, and you can get beautiful anglocytes in these systems as well. Example of cerusite, this is a miniature from a cabinet specimen, sorry, from Ojuela. Um, you can still see the galena that it was forming from. And then we get into one of my favorite minerals, wolfenite, uh, very well known from Mexico. This is from the Aurora mine. Uh, this is a miniature. Los Lamentos, which I've mentioned a couple of times, famous obviously for the wolfenite. Uh, this piece is about eight centimeters tall, brilliant orange color. You get the fat caramel cubes or fat tabular plates, again from Los Lamentos. And recently we've seen a flood of the Nadenite from San Carlos, but a certain amount of very attractive orange wolfenites came out with them. These are about a centimeter across. And the La Morita property, which has been producing, which produced briefly for about a year and a half, uh, produced some really spectacular Wolfenites. This is a large cabinet specimen. Uh, nice luster, nice color. Uh, get one now because there won't be any more. That mine has flooded. Santa Eulalia has produced some nice wolfenite. Very nice, distinct greeny yellow color. Uh, that's a miniature. And of course, the beautiful dipyramidal wolfenites from Ojuela, um, sometimes with mimetite, sometimes with little white calcite, sometimes you get these blocky uh, elongate crystals, and sometimes those get associated with bright green mimetite, uh, old, old piece from Miguel's collection. Mimetite, San Pedro Coralitos, probably the world's premier mimetite locality for the beautiful complete botryoids, nice bubbles, nice color, Benny Fenn mine tons of this stuff, it's everywhere, and it seems to be becoming more valuable by the day. Very different, but nonetheless very attractive mimetite from Santa Eulalia, different habit. This is a large spe cabinet specimen, and you get this more 
crystalline cauliflower kind of look with a slightly browner color, more butterscotch color to it, transitioning into Ojuela, where you see that sort of less well-defined uh, crystalline surface on the botryoids and a more orange uh, color. These came out four or five years ago. I mentioned the vanadinite from San Carlos. This is an example of one of the recent finds, completely blew away what had been mined there historically. That crystal is about three and a half centimeters. So this is a nice big group, beautiful color. Don't eat with Morocco unless you happen to be a Mexican collector. <clears throat> and some of the smaller pieces from there, this is a miniature with these weird curved groups, uh, kind of reminiscent of uh, the Bunker Hill. Um, not very many of these, but very attractive specimens. And again, multi-stages in the oxidation. So we have this cloazite replacing vanadinite. This is also from the Aurora mine where that wolfenite was from. Rarer species include things like carmonite from Ojuela, the calcite growing on top of it. And you, there's enough copper in these things to make some nice secondary coppers like malachite, malachite, azurite, in some cases going to malachite and then quartz on malachite after azurite from Concepcion del Oro. Rarer species include things like the clearing bullite that came out about seven or eight years ago from Ojuela, orthosuperite and Schulenbergite from a tiny mine that no one's heard of called La Platosa, uh, about 20 kilometers away from La Ojuela, very attractive material. That's about 12 centimeters across. And even weirder things like sclodowskite, which has been well known from Satiolalia, incorporated in and on gypsum from one of the smaller mines in the northern part of the West Camp. These little sprays are mm, six millimeters across. So what happens to the zinc? We've just talked about lead and some other things, but what happens to the zinc? Well, in the oxidation environment, zinc is highly mobile. If you look at data from Prescott from 1916, who studied these things, your sulfides that he found remnants of, 13% lead, 12% zinc, 29% iron, sulfur 26, specific gravity of 4.2. The oxides, the lead's upgraded a little bit. The zinc is down to 10%, roughly, of where it started. Iron is lost a little. Sulfur is almost completely gone. Specific gravity is down by 43%. So what happens to all of this zinc? And what happens is the zinc keeps getting flushed out below the iron oxide, below the lead zone. So it goes out along fractures below it and it gets dispersed and re-precipitated. So you start with a sulfide chimney and as it oxidizes, you develop the open cave, the cerusite, the mixed iron and lead carbonates, and then you start to get zinc oxides reprecipitating below that and above the sulfides. And if this process continues, you get a situation like Ojuela, where that goes to very, very considerable, considerable depth. And so you wind up with these concentric shells of zinc and iron oxides surrounding the high-grade lead oxides, which is where the silver was. So the old timers mined this out. They left this behind. And that's why we see so many things like hemimorphite and atomite coming out of Ojuela because the old timers never mined that material. In the east camp of Satiolali, we see a similar example. This was all originally lead, zinc, silver mineralization. It's oxidized to the water table. All of the zinc is flushed out of the upper part of this ore body and reprecipitated more or less right here at the water table, and then it transitions quickly into fresh sulfides. So you get a very effective separation. At right there at that transition in Sadiulali, you see things like sharp, fresh arsenopyrites covered by calcite pseudomorphed by smithsonite. Here's a broken example of what one of these things look like, or a really spectacular cabinet specimen where there's enough cadmium to make it a brilliant green color. So in Ojuela, this process affected all of this zone up here, and we wind up with all of this secondary zinc mineralization, especially accumulating down here in the deeper part of the mine. 
And that's where our beautiful hemimorphites come from from there. And the blue hemimorphites, not the COVIDite that came out this last summer, but this is from a, a small mine called Bocona in Guadalupe, Victoria, famous for this brilliant blue botryoidal hemimorphite that came out 60, 70 years ago. East Camp of Santa Eulalia, blue hemimorphite with this fine black material that you can see on the outside, which is actually platinerite incorporated in the tips of the blue hemimorphite crystals. Stunning examples of large, simple, sharp uh, hemimorphites. This is from the West Camp of Santa Eulalia. That's about six centimeters on an axis. And they are almost at 90 degrees to each other. And then into the realm of Smithsonite. And in the San Antonio mine in the East Camp of Santa Eulalia, the blue Smithsonite's rival or arguably suppress or pass the blue of Kelly mine Smithsonite's. That's a cabinet specimen. Again, they pick up enough cadmium to turn them bright yellow or green. Sometimes there is associated with aura calcite, commonly overgrown by calcite in the Oela mine as flat tabular uh, hexagonal crystals, bright blue. It preserves the aura calcite and prevents it from getting smashed. Lots of stuff like coney calcite, again, overgrown by calcite. Adamite, which of course we're all very familiar with from there, arguably the world's best uh, Adamite locality. This open bug is about 20 centimeters from side to side, beautiful balls in there. Uh, this specimen's in my collection. This is a small cabinet. Uh, if you've seen an ad from Jeff Scoville over the last five years or seven years, uh, you've seen this specimen figured in his ads. Throw in just a little copper and it starts to move into a sort of a bluer range of greens. Uh, again, a miniature specimen. Throw in a little more copper and it gets even darker, potentially gets into the realm of a, a, a zincian uh, uh, austenite. Throw in a little manganese and they go purple. So adamite can do a lot of interesting things. And as Pete Madreski, who's on the call, showed a number of years ago, those lime green ones, especially the polycrystalline lime green ones, have enough uranium in them to make them very strongly yellow-green fluorescent. Uh, the best of the atomites, uh, the purples, uh, when they grow on a white precursor, so you had a white stage covered by the purple, you see a lot of these with sort of the yellow green and the purple just doesn't come out in this sharp saturated contrast as it does. So these are the holy grail. There weren't very many of them. You get a chance to get one, you should if you're of interest. Paratomite, best known from Ojuela. Uh, this was Miguel's best specimen, so you have to go to Beirut to see this piece now. Uh, but back in the 60s, beautiful little flowers. This is a thumbnail of paratomite came out. And then in 2017, there was another find of Lagrandite and paratomite in this case with these lovely rice grain Smithsonites on top of them. So this stuff is all developing in that zone of super gene zinc where it's been flushed out and reprecipitated. Austenite is a related species shows up commonly, again, ojuela, again, a cabinet specimen, and the beautiful green balls that have been coming out for about the last five or six years. This is a small cabinet. Uh, these balls are up to about three centimeters in diameter. Cuprodiscloazite, we haven't seen much of for a while, but beautiful color, uh, really nice material when it comes out. This is a cabinet specimen, ojuela again. And Mexico is very famous as the lo type locality for Lagrandite, but most people know Lagrandite from Ojuela, not from the Flor de Pena mine, which is a tiny little rat hole in the middle of nowhere in the state of Nuevo Leon, uh, which produced uh, the type material. This is a large, this is a close up of a large specimen from Miguel Romero's collection. But of course, the stuff from Ojuela is what everybody knows and loves, these beautiful sprays of the brilliant yellow saturated. Uh, this is Jeff Starr's picture that he sent me the other day so I could show it to you. Nice miniature specimen, nice definition of the crystals, very gemmy. This was a thumbnail from the 2015 find leading up to the big find that happened in 2017. A little bit blunter than you usually see from Ojuela. 
uh, but still nice luster, nice gemminess. And of course, the Aztec Sun, Miguel Romero's signature piece. Again, you have to go to Le Lebanon to Beirut to see it. It's worth a trip just to see that specimen. Uh, that's about 20 centimeters from end to end. Uh, clearly the best Lagrandite anyone's found anywhere. Going to the other end of the spectrum is a little Lagrandite thumbnail that I bought in a collection about 10 years ago. Recognized the label as being a Perkin Sam, uh, you know, a Willard Perk, Perkin uh, mount. Uh, came with his original Perky Box label on it. And uh, so I wrote something up for FMF. Marie grabbed me and said, can you write it up? So I wrote up an article on Perkins, Perk and how he made his mounts. And um, ultimately this article saved Alex Schaus's license plates. So you can ask him about that if you don't know the story already. These deposits are in limestone, so there's lots of caves associated with them. We try not to go after the natural caves, but the ones that are intersected by the mine workings are going to be collected. This was the spectacular cave, the Potosi mine, found in the early 20th century by, by 1920. This was completely stripped out and had been shipped to museums all over the world. Weird things happen in these caves. A snake fell into one, uh, got covered with calcite, you can see the ribs where they've disarticulated from the vertebrae. This is a miniature, my collection from the San Antonio mine in East Campus at Eulalia. Gypsum, lots of sulfate moving around in these late stage fluids. At night at La Huela, sometimes it'll reprecipitate as these delicate little sprays on a miniature sized piece of gossam. But a number of the deposits, Platosa, Cave of the Candles at Santa Eulalia, which was found in, in 78, that's Bob Jones. Uh, these crystals were as much as two meters long, beautiful things. Unfortunately, the cave was completely stripped by collectors. Uh, the famous Cave of the Swords at Nica, found in 1911, nice big coarse two and a half, three meter crystals, walls completely covered with smaller crystals. This is William Foshag from the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, this is claimed to be Pancho Villa. I'm not 100% convinced, but the mustache sure looks right. These crystals, unfortunately, all had iron oxides included in them. So they're spectacular crystals, but to our aesthetic eye, they don't necessarily make it. But when you get deeper in the Nika mine, you start to pick up the limpid calcite. This is a spectacular crystal that was on exhibit in the mine, very tastefully displayed on AstroTurf. Uh, but this is about 20 centimeters from side to side. It was absolutely perfect. It was stolen by somebody. The Nika fluids or waters are filled with gypsum. So it dumps out everywhere, including in the valves and on pieces of trash that get thrown into the, into the pumping infrastructure. So you need to be careful when you're buying gypsum from Nike if you care about whether it is natural or has any kind of anthropogenic component to it. These beautiful golden specimens are anthropogenic. They grow on, they grow in the sumps, they grow on pieces of bratis cloth and stuff like that. Lovely material, but they do have a human influence. What doesn't have a human influence was something that was found in 2000. I was fortunate two weeks after it was found to be leading a field trip of Mexican and Canadian geologists down to Nica. I'd heard about a cave that had been found about six months before uh, with some nice crystals in it. The mine geologist said, how could you possibly have heard about that? But I guess if you've heard about our cave, we'll have to take you down and show you. So after looking at the mine, they took us down, walked us to the deadhead end of a, of a decline there was this hole in the wall and we climbed in and we were in the cave of the candles. This is Roberto Villasuso, who was the mine geologist at the time. Uh, we were absolutely blown away uh, by this cave. The fact that it's 130 degrees Fahrenheit and 100% humidity helps you to be blown away, uh, but absolutely spectacularly beautiful has been the subject of endless scientific research ever since, including both very elegant studies and some studies that don't really fit with what we understand about crystal growth. Um, the crystals are huge. They've been well protected. They now have the cave sealed off. So there's no 
atmospheric exchange with the outside world so the crystals don't deteriorate. But this mine is going back into production. Um, it had flooded in 2015. The water table never got within 100 meters of the cave. They're drawing the water table back down now, but they might have another 20 years of mine life to it. Ultimately, though, these crystals are so big, you're not going to be putting one in your backpack and taking it home with you. So when this mine ultimately floods, these crystals will all be flooded and, and that will be the end. Uh, so uh, if you ever get the chance to get down and get to see the cave, I highly recommend it. Uh, and with that, I will finish by telling you our theme for 2022 is the same as the theme was going to be for 2021. This is for the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Fluorescent Mineral Society and the Appetite Supergroup. So bring your mimetites, bring your appetites, bring whatever else happens to fit that category. We look forward to seeing you again in 2022. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>